All right, welcome back to part two of Modern Leadership. We're so glad you came back to join us. And remember, well, like we talked about last time, this is when our CEO talks about the decision that they made as a leadership group around the 2009 recession. Back in 2009, uh, the United States was falling into recession and it was the, uh, the end of the year and we, could, we were budgeting for 2010 and we could see that our business was gonna fall dramatically. And we were meeting right around this table right here with the, uh, all the executive team, a bunch of vice presidents trying to think how are we gonna make this go in a dramatically down year and our CEO, as we were talking about, okay, let's get started. What, what do we cut? Mm. Our CEO said, I'm not going to balance the budget on the backs of our people. Mm. I was like, yes. Nice. I love that. Everything was on the table except the people. Mm. You know, we need the people to get the work done. Uh, I think that's the right mindset. That's interesting. You know, that trust is an interesting concept, too. You know, I, I remember coming here the first time, you know, all those years ago, and even I was kind of blown away with this, this prevailing attitude of like, well, sh how are we going to do it? I, I don't know. They'll just figure it out. You know, yeah. they'll, they'll be fine. They'll, yeah. you know, they've done it before. They'll, they'll do it again. But it strikes me often that that can seem to run contrary to what they, we might call efficient processes or standardized yeah. processes. So how do you, how do you guys here <laughs> find that balance with, yeah. you know, having consistency to a process to, to generate some stable results with allowing trust to be built through some autonomy of people having, you know, an opportunity to move within it. Yeah. So, you know, when, uh, I feel like when we first started our journey, I was driving change. Mm. I remember early on when uh, we were talking about empowerment of people, uh, our CEO at the time was, was just struggling with the concept. Mm. And, 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 and I remember the look in his eye was like, look, we brought you in to drive efficiency. And, mm. and I can't tell what you're talking about. And it sounds to me like no one's making a decision and we defer it until it gets to the last person in the road and they're gonna call the shot. Mm -hmm. And that, that was kind of the thinking. I don't get this whole empowerment thing. Um, I have found that by in, truly engaging people so they want to be part of the process and they get why they're part of the process and what they're doing, they make incredible things happen. You get them pointed in the right direction and they care about it and, and they see a purpose and a reason for doing it, uh, they make great things happen. And compared to early on when I was driving things, I mean, we were making steady gains. When the people started to engage and make things happen, I mean, it just took off like this. And now so much is going on, I, I can't keep track of it. it. It's not something that any manager could manage all these different pieces. You just gotta let them go, yeah. you know? And then, and then they tell you what they're doing. You're like, wow, that's great. That explains the numbers, you know? Yeah. And I think that's really a key point. I mean, number one, it hasn't been a sacrificing performance in the name of people at all. In no. fact, it's been, you know, every yeah. time I, I see you kind of update your slides, so to speak, and you're speaking at another conference, it's like the results just keep coming keep and coming. more exciting things keep happening that are being driven by this yeah. commitment, I think, that you have in this culture of engaging but aligning this energy of people. So we've been doing this more than 30 years and uh, I hear people talk about low-hanging fruit. Yeah, once you pick the low-hanging fruit, then it gets tougher. I, it hasn't gotten tougher. Every time we turn around, there's more fruit on the tree, and we, we just kind of decided that this idea of low-hanging fruit is a myth. Mm, interesting. Yeah, every time they're there, there's more fruit. Let's get it. And, and when I talk to the teams about, are you running out of ideas? Are you running out of things to do? They just laugh, you know? Mm. There's no end of it, I think. Yeah. You know, you mentioned purpose, yeah, you know, yeah. and kind of the reason why they do it. So at, at OC Tanner here, you know, uh, what is the, is there one kind of overarching, you know, yeah. reason for being the purpose? Is it, is it the helping people do, you know, recognize great work? Is that what binds people together? Or is it, you know, is it, is it really this, this feeling of the culture and this commitment to bringing out the best in each other that is the, their reason yeah, for being I love here. what you're saying, Mike. At the top of our strategy map, it says, 
we help people thrive at work. Mm -hmm. And it is certainly our customers. It is certainly their employees, the recipients of our awards. It is certainly each other. It is people in other departments. It's, uh, we're just whatever we can do. It's an outward mindset of helping people thrive. And um, it drives our people. There's a ton of pride that comes from being part of that purpose statement. You know, we do the Great Place to Work survey on an annual basis, and there's a question about pride in where you work. And those highest scores typically go to uh, uh, emergency services, medical care, things like that. O.C. Tanner's pride is above all of them. Interesting. I think people are like, yeah, what we do matters. It makes mm -hmm. a difference. We choose to believe that it makes a difference, you know, right. that, that, that employees are using these awards to really help each other thrive. Now, how often when you get people that come here and, the, you know, you mentioned visitors, you get a yeah. lot of visitors that come here. How often do they really dig into that as one of the reasons why they're seeing? Do they make that connection? I don't find that people make the connection uh -huh. as to maybe how important that seemingly simple statement is to really creating or, or maybe launching this alignment that you have around people. I think it's very important as you do. And so we always emphasize it, that having this purpose mm. matters. And we talk about why it matters and how our people connect with it. Um, I see other companies struggling with, okay, well, what is my purpose? You know, what, what is it that my people rally around? I, th I see them working on it, but I, and I don't mm. think they're gonna come up with it while they're sitting there. Mm. I think it's gonna go back and take some serious work about, what is the purpose that drives our people to a right, better place, right. helps them you know, make things happen. Uh, we do talk about it. In fact, we had a group here, uh, we're a go and see site for McKinsey. So they had a bunch of clients here last week and we did an employee panel at the end of the day. So I had like five hourly workers sitting in front of them. And the third question uh, was, tell us about your purpose. Mm, How do you connect to the purpose of this company? And and I was so proud, you know, the, the, the first lady who answered the question is, our purpose is we help people thrive at work. As soon as she said it, everyone in the room was like, that's what, that's what he said they'd say, you know? <laughs> it's like, and then, you know, she launched into why it matters. And I mean, it was convincing, it was powerful. It was, okay, I get the drive, you know? Yeah. The, you hear a lot of talk about, you know, generations, you know, differences in generations and, and you see it written a lot or, or discussed now how more important having that purpose is to kind of the yeah. younger workers coming in. Now, do you find that here as well? Do you find that that connecting to that purpose is becoming stronger? Is it becoming more important as, as the workforce is changing or has this always been... <laughs> you know, almost such a, such a premier focus of yours that you really see it across the demographics. I see it across the demographics. And I, I think, uh, I've actually noticed that, that, that it doesn't matter what year someone was born in, human beings have this need to connect to something. They want to be part of something bigger than themselves. Mm. You know, I, give me a purpose, give me a reason for being and they're seeking for that. And I think when a job doesn't have that, well, then it's just mundane. I'm, I do my thing, I put in my time, punch in, punch out, go home. Whereas if there's purposeful work, if there's, if there's meaning and power in it, I gotta go to work. Mm. I got big things to do today. Yeah. You know, I made great things happen today. I mean, that, that's what I think is more important. Every, you know, regardless of, of uh, you know, millennial or, or um, uh, boomer or whatever. Um, I mean, everybody is so different anyway. People the same age, you have every type of person imaginable. Right. And I think the most important thing is that we, we learn to honor and cherish the differences in humanity. You know, the fact that we are so different, well, that's wonderful. Mm. You know, it just makes our dialogue that much better that we can, we can have all these different ways of looking at the world and seeing this problem. And, and that's one of our power, powerful assets here is that we have such a diverse workforce. And it's, it's age, it's background, it's ethnicity, it's country of origin, uh, everything imaginable. Now with that, you know, that connecting to the purpose, 
You know, there's, there's connecting to the purpose because it's inherent to the work we do. Like, let's say, you know, I'm a, uh, in the ER and I literally save a life. I, I had an opportunity to save a life. And then there's other opportunities that we might find that people have pride in their purpose. And that's really connected to their contribution at work. You know, maybe it's not even the job itself. It's, it's what they get to bring to work. So how important is it here at OC Tanner to this sense of pride, this really sense of purpose and connection to pride that you have continuous improvement, you know, listening to a voice, you know, uh, active engagement of people in Kaizen. How yeah. important is that to their sense of pride and I love fulfilling purpose? What a great question. You know, after we had been on our journey for, I'm going to say just about five years, uh, I was sitting in my office, uh, I had, had these, these glass walls. I was watching people go home from the end of the shift, you know, and people were coming in, you know. As people were walking out the door for the first time, all of a sudden I realized they look so powerful. Mm. And, and, and I was almost like seeing it for the first time. I hadn't seen them like that before. And I, I, was, I was watching, I was thinking they didn't used to look like that. But look at them. They look powerful. They're walking out this door with, with, with kind of a sense of self. Right. And I thought to myself, my golly, they're not just making things better at OC Tanner. They're going to walk out that door, they're going to go home, and they're going to fix something at home. Right. And in their mm -hmm. communities, in their churches, in their schools. And, and they're, they're, it's like in them now. I can make a difference. I can do it. And, and I, don't think there was, I don't think there was any way to turn it off now. Mm -hmm. It's just part of who they are. And... Uh, when I saw that, we, we got to talking about that with my team, and we thought, you know what? Uh, we're not just changing the OC Tanner company, we're changing the world, mm. one family at a time, one community at a time. Uh, and I think that's what makes this such an important work, is that we're actually, I think we're making the world a better place by making citizens who are able to make great things happen. Mm. Oh, that's a great way, I like the way you say that. You know, when we worked with coaches in the past, you mentioned it earlier with the coaching camp, um, you know, we saw that, that even using the same system, you know, yeah. we saw different results, you know, some right. having more success than right. others and, and not always being a function of the time they spent coaching. You know, it wasn't just if I gave it more hours, I had more success. There was this behavioral component. And you also uh, serve on the Shingo board and you guys are Shingo uh, recipient organization. We talk a lot about, you know, ideal behaviors. And, and I'm just curious, you know, when we're thinking about this purpose, this sense of, you know, our role in creating these con contributors to a better world, for you guys, what are some of the behaviors you're looking for, for from leaders? You know, how, if we were going out there now, you know, had an opportunity, where, where would we be flagging things that it's like, okay, yeah. that's the behavior we're looking for. That's, that's going to better connect a purpose. That's going to lead to an increase in pride, you know, things like that. Yeah. I think certainly uh, uh, a smile and a, mm -hmm. and a warm look would be very important. Mm -hmm. uh, when a coaching, our coaching system is our most easily uh, identifiable system because you can always look around, see two people in the middle of a coaching session. Mm -hmm. And I'm fond of pointing it out to tour groups. I says, that's a coaching session going on right there. What do you see? Mm. And they always say, well, they both look happy. I said, that's, is that weird? And, you know, they, they both look like they're enjoying themselves. They look like they're getting things done. So yeah, that's, that's what we like to see. That's what our coaching is like. Um, so I think, I think that happiness, that, that joy in the work, mm. it certainly matters. I think that the leader sets the tone for that. I uh, love a team member who sets the tone for that, mm. who comes in and raises everybody up. Uh, I'll also tell you that when, uh, when my executive team, my directors, my vice presidents and I go and visit a team, which we do every three months around strategy deployment, um, we walk into the team with the notion of, you guys have done amazing things, mm. show us. Mm. Can't wait to see. You know, there's no, show me. Convince right. me, mm, you know, let's see, let's see what you've done here. And I'll, I'll maybe decide whether I think that's pretty good or not. None of that. It's always like, yeah, right. What have you done? Mm, oh, that's amazing. That's great. And, and we don't, we don't go in there with the intent of showing them how smart we are. 
showing them that we can find, you know, great opportunities for them. We can, we can open the next door for them. We don't do that at all. We go purely with the idea of being mesmerized by their brilliance. Mm. And we don't have to act. They truly mesmerize us. And, I th and, and you won't be surprised, you know, they love to see us come. Right. Because I think we make them feel good and they make us feel good. I think it's just, it's kind of a nice symbiotic relationship. So again, this, 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 I think one of the, so going back to the question, one of the expectations of a leader, for example, is to believe mm. in people, to have high expectations and just to expect people to deliver. And, and I like team members who do that too, who believe in each other, who believe in themselves, who, who want things to be good, who expect the best of each other and, and who even, um, prop each other up to give their best. You know, not, not everyone comes perfectly capable every day. You know, I may, I may have a problem today with my son who, you know, got picked up last night and is in jail or something. You know, I don't know. And, and I may be a little bit distracted and I want to be surrounded by a team who sees that mm. and who is like, Hey, Gary needs my help today. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to prop him up a little bit because tomorrow he'll be propping me up. That's great. You know, I think that's, a, I think that's also a very important attribute. Hmm. How much of this, if any, is tied to really you, what you do in your core business here? I mean, you are mm. in recognition and in yeah. and helping to generate appreciation cultures. Yeah. So is there some of this that just naturally aligns to this is our entire thing, expect and be on the lookout for yeah. great work appreciate it and does that kind of influence how you guys show up yeah. in strategy and as leaders it certainly doesn't hurt that <laughs> it okay, certainly good. doesn't hurt that we're built on good feelings we're, we're built on positive juju we're built on you know making things better for people i think that's a big deal well and and it it, it strikes me you know i had all these questions here and we're going off in great uh direction which is awesome but we haven't once yet talked at all about um, specific tools, tactics, and techniques yeah. of management. Yeah. We haven't talked about anything yet about, um, you know, technically how do we uh, set the goals or technically no. how do we get, you know, get their ideas or, 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 you know, help implement their ideas. So, you know, with everything so far around the discussion of obviously what's, what's important around here to driving, you know, fulfillment, passion, pride and, and that performance, how much of a role and in what role does the, does the management system, you know, those elements, yeah, yeah. does it play in this? So I think we have been, we've been very careful to define systems that help us get the right behaviors that, that we want from people. If we're not seeing, you know, if there's a behavior that's lacking, uh, we ask ourselves, what's the principle that we're missing? You know, what, what is it? What is it that we're not connecting with? Well, is our system not working or do we need to improve the system? Do we need a new system? Mm -hmm. Or maybe we have a system in place. that's a, a vestige of an old world when, when somebody got in trouble and we'll put a system in to make sure that never happens again. Maybe we have some systems like that, that are bureaucracy that are in the way that are actually, uh, creating the wrong behaviors amongst people. Mm. Uh, I think you have to always be looking at, you know, what are the systems we're using? Are they giving us what we want? If you're not getting what you want, it's not a matter of beating on people. It's a matter of fine tuning the system. Mm. So if you only had three more, we're rounding more out systems? your top five, the ones that, because you know, <laughs> I was just at an organization who was, uh -huh. you know, did, did a, did a workshop and was the, the discussing their 137 systems that they were able to map out. And when I suggested that there might be a rightful priority or which ones are the most important yeah. to getting this culture, you know, top five, what are the other three that? Well, so, so coaching, I think is our number one okay. most important uh, system. It's probably the one we've had the longest. It's the uh -huh. one we've worked the hardest at to uh -huh. improve and get there. And I think it's made a ton of difference for us. Uh, I would probably put strategy deployment third. Ooh. I think the, the second one is our improvement system. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, we have a, a beautiful system where, where teams come up with ideas, they share them with each other, they kick them around during team meetings, they implement them themselves. There's not like a board of people who review their ideas. It's their ideas, implement it. You know, if you right, want to do right. it, do it. Uh, the improvement uh, system is, is a brilliant one. Okay. So that's one, two, three, strategy deployment Got number it. three. 
Uh, I would probably say the next one, it probably has to be team meetings and huddles. Uh, so kind of your uh, follow up in terms of getting that rhythm of execution. Yeah, and us, us talking together as a team okay. about how are we going to succeed today? How did we do? What else can we do? How can we improve? That happens in, in that environment. And I'm going to say the fifth system is our hiring system. Ooh. Bringing the right people in the door, the people who match the culture. Hire for culture, not for skill set. Interesting. All right. You threw me with number five. I'm not going to uh, lie to you. Good. You thought maybe I might say... I thought you were going to talk recognition, but here's mm. why I don't think it was number five. I'm curious because it's probably so ingrained, ingrained in, in us. what you do now that it is not thought of as something yeah. separate that you do. Recognition is ingrained in what we do every day. It's interesting. The uh, So every team, every huddle, every meeting has a moment where people are invited to recognize somebody. Mm -hmm. And they get comfortable at it, they get good at it, and everybody likes to be recognized. I mean, because it's, it's just part of what we do. Um, I had a hypo an hypothesis that, that maybe the teams who um, felt the most accountability, had the strongest results, would be doing the most recognition. And it was actually found out the opposite was true that people, I don't, I don't mean the opposite the way it sounded, <laughs> what I found was the teams who recognize most have the, mo have the strongest drives uh, results. They, mm. they, they own their results, they drove accountability. And so what was your hypothesis again? So it was the other way, that I thought, I thought it would be ownership that would drive recognition, but it seems uh, to us that the more... Chicken and the egg. Yeah, so it's not uh. that I want to be recognized, it's that I want to recognize. So uh, if, if instead of, if I'm like passively sitting back and say, yeah, say something great about me, honor me, value me, and I'll do better, that, that is good. But the more powerful is if, if I go out and, and go out of my way to say good things about you, to honor you, to value you, my results go up. Interesting. Hey, look at that. I got a lemon off of this tree and it was really easy to reach. We consider that to be low-hanging fruit. Makes sense, makes sense. Looks delicious. It does. So with improvements, there is this idea that there is low-hanging fruit that's always available to us to grab and to make improvements in the team. But Gary talks about how there's always seems to be like this refreshing of low-hanging fruit. I love it. We get higher up on our ladder and it gets easier to get those, doesn't it? We're so excited that you stuck around for this video. Stick around for next time. We're going to talk about how to discipline teams, and Gary's going to dive in to what discipline looks like at OC Canada. And I'm smiling because my feet are chattering. <laughs> <laughs> we hope that you like and we hope that you like this video, and come back and subscribe so that you can watch the rest of these videos. Thank you so much. <laughs> Just the break, the pause. Let's dive in. It's all good. And then, <laughs> I was thinking about doing that. Oh yeah, yeah. And I like pull the fruit from the from the plant. You were shooting. Um, give us <laughs> Might be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> this is where we get all of our lemons from our lemon right. tree in you know tree. northern Utah. I'm just gonna go.